months on this video, I'm going to be reading through my IB Hate Girl History IA. I got a 7 in this IA and I scored 21 out of 24, so it's not perfect by any means, but I still got a 7, so that's good. <laughs> the purpose of this video is to hopefully provide you with a model of which you can base your IA off of. So hopefully this IA can provide you with some ideas for how you can structure IA, how to write historically in an IA, what you can talk about for your reflective statement, and give you an example for the OPVL. If you want to download this IA, I have a page on my blog where I've got a link to all of the IAs I did and you can just find the history one and download it and read it if you like. And yeah, I hope this uh, helps anyone who's trying to find an example of uh, IB History HLIA because I know I wish I did uh, when I first started IB History. I also just want to preface that I know history can get uh, a bit controversial sometimes and I am in no means coming from the perspective that I am an expert on the topic that I am writing about different interpretations of this period of time in history and I am not uh, the expert on Guatemala in the uh, 1960s <laughs> I just quote experts I'm just sharing my IA with the purpose of giving you an example for what the structure of an IA can be like and what the style of the writing is like, not to educate you on this topic. <laughs> yeah, so let's get started. So first I'm going to give a brief introduction into what the History IA is about. So the IB History IA makes up 20% of your mark. It's scored out of 24 points and it consists of three different parts. So the first section is identification. In this section you write a short paragraph about what happened in your event to give the examiner context about what you're talking about. Then you do two OPCVLs in which you evaluate the origin, purpose, content, values and limitations of two sources that you use in your essay. Then in section two is your actual essay in which you answer the research question that you have set for yourself and you write a historical analysis answering the question that you set for yourself. Then in section three it's kind of a weird one, I don't really know how to explain, but it's basically where you do a reflection on being a historian. It's kind of TOK-ish and pretty much like where I got my ideas for writing a reflection was from my TOK essay. So yeah, you basically reflect on being a historian. There's a few uh, prompts uh, given in the IB guide as to how to write the reflection. You basically talk about how your own biases come into it, what you learned, like, you know, all that weird like reflection-y stuff that you do. And then of course at the bottom you got to have your uh, citations because those are important. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. So the word count is 2,200 words and I've got a total of 2,200 words. So I really pushed the word limit max on this assignment. So here's the first paragraph in which I introduce the topic that I will be discussing. On June 27, 1954, as a result of a CIA orchestrated coup, democratically elected Jacobo Arbenz officially resigned from power. Ten days later, military leader Castillo Armas assumed presidency. Much debate has taken place over the reasons for American intervention in Guatemala. Therefore, this investigation will question what were the key reasons for CIA involvement in the 1954 coup d'etat in Guatemala. So as you can see there, basically I just sum up what happened, talk about how there's debate, and introduce my question. Okay, now for the first OPVCL. Steven Slicinger's Bitter Fruit, the story of the American coup in Guatemala, 1982, is a comprehensive account of the CIA operation to overthrow Jacobo Arbenz of Guatemala in 1954. It emphasizes the role of the UFCO, suggesting that the coup was to preserve the company's economic interests, being challenged by Arbenz's socialist reforms. The source is valuable as it explores a variety of key source material, such as declassified CIA government documents and interviews with important decision makers, making it valuable in analyzing the reasons for the decision to invade Guatemala. However, post-revisionists point to its limitations, suggesting that the source incorporates selective evidence on the UFCO. For example, it ignores the fact that the U.S. Justice Department sued the UFCO just shortly after the coup. The purpose of this book, to expose the UFCO slash U.S. relationship, could have potentially been exaggerated, perhaps to sell an interesting and marketable narrative. The source's origin is valuable, as Schlesinger is an international affairs specialist who worked in governmental services abroad after studying U.S. history at Harvard University. Being American, his critique of the CIA's behaviors is not clouded by general anti-American sentiments that non-Western critics may harbor. His career has eventually allowed him access to CIA documentation and interviews with former CIA officials, adding value. He wrote several decades after the coup, giving him the benefit of hindsight. However, the timing may also impart limitations. 
For example, the book was written prior to the end of the Cold War and the opening of the Soviet archives. Now moving on to the second source. Okay, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but this is what I'm saying. So, Piero Glycesis's 1992 book, Shattered Hope, details the overthrow of Arbenz and shows the lasting ruinous impact of US intervention in Guatemala. The source's origin has value. The source's origin has value. Glycesis has a PhD in international relations, is a professor of US foreign policy, and has written six other books on Latin America. Written 38 years after the invasion, Glycesis had access to newly released CIA documents, interviews with people directly involved in the conflict, such as those closest to Arbenz, namely his wife and his confidant, Jose Fortuny, leader of the Communist Party. Moreover, Glycesis' evidence is not limited to simply Arbenz's allies, but also includes many of his rivals, US officials and military officers. As well, the content is valuable as it is narrow in scope, 1944 to 1954 focusing on the coup itself, and as a post-revisionist, Glycesis offers a fresh new perspective. He downplays the role of the UFCL, acknowledges Arbenz's genuine interest in communism, yet discredits the Moscow connection. However, a limitation of the source is that Glycesis is European and thus may be influenced by his Western values. He is writing in 1992, and thus Cold War sentiments may have also shaped his perspective and limited his choice of source material. Okay, moving on to section two, the interesting part, the actual investigation in which I conduct a historical analysis attempting to answer my research question. So once again, uh, my research question is, what were the key reasons for CIA involvement in the 1954 coup d'etat coup in Guatemala? So in my history, I, I basically break it up into three different perspectives in which I argue and talk about. So essentially what I do is I outline the reasons why the orthodox perspective has value, then I outline the revisionist perspective and why that has value, then eventually I lead to the post-revisionist perspective, which kind of takes ideas from the orthodox and the revisionist perspective, but then because of hindsight is able to look at it more objectively or something. So first I talk about the orthodox perspective so here we go the orthodox view as to the reasons behind the American backed invasion of Guatemala in 1954 was a desire to prohibit the rise of communism and remove the left-leaning leader Jacobo Arbenz who was believed to have ties in Moscow whilst Arbenz never officially declared himself a communist his actions suggested that he was willingly cooperating with them indeed under Arbenz the once illegal communist party Partido Guatemalteco del Trabajo regained, quote, legal status under the name of the Guatemalan Labor Party, unquote. One 1954 CIA document reported that following the Guatemalan Revolution, the communists and their sympathizers gained extensive and increasing influence within the government. Moreover, Arbenz pursued socialist reforms in education and healthcare, and the Eisenhower administration suggested Arbenz's radical land distribution campaign, Decree 900, was originally designed by the PGT. Moreover, Arbenz pursued socialist reforms in education and healthcare, and the Eisenhower administration suggested Arbenz's radical land redistribution campaign, Degree 900, was originally designed by the PGT. By 1952, Arbenz had expropriated 234,000 acres of land for rural workers and farmers, suggesting he was a closet communist. Another CIA document reported a Guatemala purchase of Soviet-made armaments from Czechoslovakia, which supported the perceived Moscow alignment. David Barrett's article, Sterilizing a Red Infection, illustrates the genuine fear of rising Soviet-backed communism in American Congress, who propagated the Soviet connection, pushing Eisenhower to take action. Texas Representative Jack Brooks expressed Arbenz's rule as a direct challenge by the Soviets to the Monroe Doctrine and believed actions taken against our bends would demonstrate U.S. commitment to the doctrine. Wisconsin Senator Alexander Wiley denied any homegrown communist theories, insisting on the monolithic view. Additionally, John Periphery, a U.S. ambassador in Guatemala, sent a telegram to the State Department stressing the need for U.S. to work actively and quickly to assure that Guatemalan government is taken over. Additionally, John Periphery, a U.S. ambassador in Guatemala, sent a telegram to the State Department stressing for the need for the U.S. government to work actively and quickly to assure that the Guatemalan government is taken over. Having met Arbenz, he warned that an eventual communist uprising would endanger U.S. security and economic interests. Eisenhower's memoir stated Arbenz was merely a puppet manipulated by the communists, and after 1954, thanks to Operation Liberation, Guatemala was finally free. In the context of the Cold War, the CIA's invasion of Guatemala could be seen as Eisenhower's commitment to his New Look policy, 
in which he aimed to undermine Soviet control through covert operations to quote-unquote roll back communism. CIA agent David Edley Phillips insisted that the desire for Soviet expansionism into Latin America was a reality, citing papers left behind by Arbenz after his overthrow. Now I'm going to be moving into the revisionist perspective. However, this perspective is contradicted by the revisionist historians who, in the wake of the Vietnam War, began to, quote, question the prevailing dogma of the Cold War, unquote. One CIA document concluded Arbenz was not a communist and that the PGT did not have influence over his decision making. Indeed, when Arbenz took office, he declared his three main objectives, economic independence, the establishment of a modern capitalist state, and an increase in the standard of living for the population. The document reported Arbenz was motivated by Roosevelt's New Deal and was, quote, simply using the communists to further his own end, unquote. As a result, Arbenz had no fear of a conservative coup. The fact that this information came from a CIA document gives it historical weight and points to the possible alternative reasons for America's involvement in Arbenz's overthrow. Other scholars cite the small size of the PGT and strongly conservative nature of Guatemalan society, for example the army and the church, as evidence the communists that was exaggerated. Moreover, historian Rave insists Arbenz's social welfare program was modest in comparison to U.S. Democrats' platform. Indeed, according to a more recent 1994 CIA report, U.S. officials considered Decree 900 to be moderate, calling it constructive and democratic in its aims, similar to agrarian programs the U.S. was sponsoring in Japan. These facts, coupled with the U.S.'s attempt to hide their involvement in the coup, Eisenhower's memoir mentioned the coup without any reference to America's involvement, suggests there were perhaps alternative reasons for U.S. intervention. Arbenz's resignation speech condemned Americans for exploiting the pretext of communism as justification for intervention. He suggested the coup was instead an act of vengeance on behalf of the United Fruit Company. Senator William Langer, well-known critic of U.S. foreign policy, who voted against U.S. intervention in Guatemala, challenged the perceived Soviet connection and also addressed the more prevalent influence of the $548 million United Fruit Company in Guatemala which he regarded as bigger than the government itself. The argument that U.S. intervention was an effort to conserve U.S. economic interests is the core of the revisionist perspective. Cold War historian Daniel Gordon states before our bends, UFCO had managed to acquire 42% of Guatemala's land and was exempted from all taxes and duties both on imports and exports. Locals referred to the company as the octopus as it enjoyed extensive privileges. Revisionist Schlesinger and Kinzer cite evidence to show the UFCO feared Arbenz's regime would damage their economic interests and thus spread propaganda that targeted him as a communist pressuring the Eisenhower administration to act. Yet he only refused to pay compensation prices because they were exorbitant, 15 times higher. Historian Thomas McCann recounts UFCO lobbyists openly bragging about propagating news stories that exaggerated the communist threat in Guatemala in efforts to persuade Eisenhower to overthrow Arbenz. Additionally to Gordon, according to Gordon, US politicians involved in the operation were reported to have ties with the UFCO, such as Secretary of State Jordan Foster Woodall's and CIA director Alan Dahls, who served on the board of trustees. Thus, according to revisionists, it was the UFCO and these individuals who labeled Arbenz as a communist, convincing Eisenhower that democratically elected Arbenz had to be removed from power. Thus, according to revisionists, it was the UFCO and these individuals who labeled Arbenz a communist, convincing Eisenhower that the democratically elected Arbenz, quote, had to be removed from power. Revisionists further blamed U.S. dollar imperialism for the installation of Armaz as president. Interviews conducted with Guatemalan exiles labeled Armaz as a, quote, Wall Street lackey who received payments for agreements to restore UFCO power over Guatemalan land once in power. Gordon reports that Armaz imprisoned and tortured Guatemalans who attempted to revolt. Armaz further disenfranchised illiterate voters, outlied all political parties, peasant organizations, and labor unions. Most importantly, Armaz immediately revoked all social reforms instigated by Arbenz and returned Guatemala to the economic subservience in the hands of the UFCO. So that was the revisionist perspective. It really strongly counters the orthodox perspective. So now I'm going to move on to the post-revisionist perspective, which kind of takes like ideas from both the orthodox and the revisionist with a uh, like new spin to it, okay, basically. Post-revisionist historiography sheds light on this debate. Stephen Streeter disputes the evidence used to demonize the UFCO, citing CIA official Richard Bissell, who said he had never heard Alan Dulles discuss United Fruits' interests. Richard Immerman's study states that it was not lobbying from the UFCO, 
but U.S. officials had confused communism with nationalism. He demonstrated how Cold War cultural bias warped Washington's conception of Guatemala and exaggerated the communist threat. A recently declassified CIA report, 1997, also downplays the influence of the UFCO in Washington and instead shows their greater concerns for the spread of communist ideals to the countryside and the eventual organization and rise of the masses. In short, this perspective suggests U.S. business interests were not primarily the reason for intervention. Piero Glacius's Shattered Hope also supports the idea of Arbenz as a possible communist threat. His book includes interviews with Arbenz's widow and members of the PGT who supported to some degree the orthodox view that Arbenz had significant communist ties and sympathized with the communist vision. They recounted he read many books on Marxism and the Russian Revolution, which together molded his way of looking at the world. His wife added, Jacobo was convinced that the triumph of communism in the world was inevitable and desirable. The march of history was towards communism. Capitalism was doomed. However, Glacius's perspective differs from the orthodox view in that he strongly disputes the Moscow connection to our bands and the BGT, offering new evidence that shows the Soviets rejected Guatemala communist pleas for aim. And after having made that argument, I finally come to a conclusion. Ultimately, it seems the key reason for CIA's intervention in Guatemala was to prevent the country from being a precedent for other Latin American countries to carry out socialist slash communist reform and attempt to develop independence from the United States. Arbenz's nationalist movement was viewed by Congress as communist and thus developed a stereotype that could not be refuted. It became clear that the monolithic view of communism stifled any debate over Guatemala and instead created an image of Arbenz as a communist that could not be challenged. Whilst the UFCO's interests may have been seen as the primary aim of the coup, as revisionists suggest, post-revisionist sources show that the threat of communism was not wholly unfounded, and it appears it was the Cold War policy of containment that primarily drove U.S. policy in Guatemala. And here comes the best part. Indeed, former leader of the Guatemalan Communist Party, Jose Manuel Fortuny, concluded that they would have overgrown us even if we had grown no bananas. Boom. <laughs> Okay, that's just the second part, just kidding, gotta open you up, password. Finally, we come to section three, which is a reflection in which I reflect on what it was like to be a historian. I don't really get this section. Upon reflecting on my historical investigation, good start, I internalized how nothing in history, the present or the future, can ever be fully determined. I discussed the perspectives from the orthodox perspective to the revisionist perspective to the post-revisionist perspective, which each viewed the same event very differently and I recognize historians view events through different lenses, shaped by the culture of the time and the available evidence. For example, orthodox historians looked at U.S. actions in Guatemala through a strong anti-communist, anti-Soviet lens. Revisionist historians, on the other hand, disillusioned with the U.S. government and their role in the Vietnam War, saw the U.S. actions in Guatemala not as a result of Soviet threat, but as a pursuit of business. Whilst conducting my historical investigation on the coup, I faced this exact challenge. Admittedly, I initially sided with the revisionist and focused my attention on sources that supported their arguments. However, my discovery of the post-revisionist perspective seemed to discredit my initial conclusions, and after cross-referencing them with other sources, I realized I needed to work this viewpoint into my essay. So this actually happened. Like, I had the orthodox perspective, and I had the revisionist perspective, and I was like, cool, it's the revisionist perspective, that's the answer. But then I found the post-revisionist perspective, and I was like, oh shit. Like, this perspective is like, really like, like it's saying something, you know? So I actually had to re-add that into my History IA to make it like, so much better. This sudden discovery that indeed our Benz may had communist sympathizers, based on the testimony of his widow and his closet confidant, served to develop my understanding of the subjectivity of history and how it can be distorted by historians' aims to prove their viewpoints. I came to better understand that the role of a historian is not to represent absolute truths, but is instead to investigate a plethora of claims and reach a well-sustained argument which is supported by historical sources and yet subject to change upon the discovery of new evidence and perspectives. So basically I just reflected on one of the issues that I had in my A, which was deciding which historical perspective to go with and which to choose, like I didn't know. And then at the end of course I just have a bunch of sources. Yes. So anyways, that brings us to the end of this video. I hope that helped anyone who's trying to figure out how to structure or write or write about their uh, historical investigation.